we're, we began a series on Lord of my heart, and last week we dealt with the Lord of my sadness from Psalm 13. If you didn't get a chance to see that, it's available on the website. I encourage you to tune in to that. God was a help to you. Today, we'll spend some time talking about the Lord of my anger from Psalm 37. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, our reflection verse this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 4 through 9. Jesus saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is the word of the Lord. Would you stand together and let's sing. If you're able to stand, stand and join us. Stretch a little bit. Be still, my soul. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Still need to 
this song should be sung in the back table. to God's word. Psalm 37. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from evil and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. This is the word of the Lord. Church, as we are, uh, as we're gathered today, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 37. We've spoken at length about surrendering our lives to the Lord, but what happens when the world begins to crumble in front of us? Now, make no mistake, there has been sin and brokenness and problems for a long time, but it's hard to turn on the news or to open your device or to engage in any kind of conversation with anybody that's dialed in in the last week and not know that uh, these are perilous times that we're living in. So how do you, what do you do with your sadness? Well, we talked about surrendering that to the Lord and how to avoid spiraling with your sadness. Well, what do you do with your anger? Different story, is it? God is calling His church, I believe, to steward this moment well, as He calls us to steward every moment. But we look around and, and find no shortage of images or instances to get infuriated about. There's a lot to be angry about these days. The question is, the question David wrestles with here in Psalm 37 is, 
How can I steward this anger well? How do I keep from spiraling and stewing in my own anger? How can I be angry and glorify God? Anybody wrestling with that? I mean, there's some stuff I believe that ought to have us, well, the modern vernacular would be ticked off. How do I do this and glorify the Lord? Well, I'm going to tell you something. (laughs) This sounds counterintuitive, almost like an oxymoron, but it's tougher and simpler than you think. Whether you're on the mountaintop or in the valley, whether at the height of victory or the depths of defeat, God's call to His people is always, at all times, to glorify Him and to point others to Him. Let me give you a headline. The Age of Rage. Are we really living in angrier times? Subtext, flashpoint. As a society, we seem not to express anger and move on, but to stew in it until at the extremes it hardens into violence and hate. You ready? Dateline, April 2019. Shakespeare would write, Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. I'm thinking about Mr. Potato Head grabbing his angry eyes. I think he would have them in this day and age in which we're looking at. Or maybe anger from the Pixar flick Inside Out saying we should really lock the door and scream that curse word we know. It's a good one. What do you do with your anger? How do you steward it well? How do you stay on top of it? The American Psychological Association defines anger as an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something you feel has deliberately done you wrong. Anger can be a good thing. It can give you a way to express negative feelings, for example, or motivate you to find solutions to problems. But excessive anger, the APA, excessive anger causes problems, increases blood pressure, and other physical changes associated with anger might make it difficult to think straight and harm your physical and mental health. What does the Bible say about anger? Though anger can often be justified, often it's jealousy, pride, or even a rebellion against the truth that moves us toward anger the most often. We often judge others by a law and a standard that we can't keep, and we get really mad when they blow it while we're giving ourselves a pass. There never was an angry man that thought his anger unjust. Question, what are some of the lessons we learn from God's Word about anger? This is a side note. I'll get to the text in just a moment. But anger, the Bible says, results in strife. Genesis 4, 8, one of the earliest accounts we have. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. This because his offering was not received. And God said, why? Why are you stirring up anger in your own life? 1 Samuel 2, Psalm 124, Proverbs 29. All these notes are in your notes online in the app or you version. Anger leads to strife. Anger results in God's judgment, according to Matthew 5, 22. The Bible says, but I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Anger leads most often. James 1, 20 says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So how do we deal with it? The Bible says we ought to be slow to anger. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. It, love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Are you irritable these days? Are you short-fused these days? Are your peers or family or kids or girlfriend waiting on you to blow up? Something's about to push him or her over the edge. These things ought not be named of us. We deal with our anger by not taking revenge. The Bible says in Romans 12, leave it to the wrath of God. 
he's capable of executing just as well. We renounce our anger. Ephesians 4, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from among us. Bitterness, wrath, anger, malice. The Mental Health America site records it this way. Anger moves us to action. We might defend ourselves, leave a bad situation, or help somebody else. But too much anger can be toxic. It can control us and damage our relationship, our physical health, work, and daily experience. Experiencing anger all the time is exhausting for us and challenging or even scary for the people around us. I have seen, as have you, news report after news report after news report of minority race and majority race saying, I'm just tired, I'm exhausted, I'm worn out by all of this. Can I tell you something? It's the only thing we can be when we try to carry these burdens ourselves. It's rarely good to be angry. It's never good to stew in anger. Whether justified or not, surrendering our anger to the Lord is the best way to keep wicked people from getting under our skin. The Bible gives us an alternative. It's countercultural, and it, it helps us avoid mimicking the wicked and offending the Lord. This psalm, Psalm 37, is classified as a wisdom psalm. It contains a number of proverbs that could stand alone. It's also, for you Bible nerds, an acrostic poem. It has 21 units that begin with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and they begin in order. Much of our time this morning will center on these first few verses because I believe they point us to the task of surrendering our anger to the Lord. That means I'd like for you to read and meditate on the rest of this. I've got some headings for the whole psalm, but you'll find the bulk of our time right there. So how do we steward our anger well? Let's look at the text with me. You got it? Psalm 37. You got your Bibles or your phones out. Fret not yourselves for evildoers nor be envious of wrongdoers, for they'll soon fade like grass or wither like the green herb. Look at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Let me give you a few headers if you're taking notes. Number one is focus. Now, there are four things under focus, which is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. But the first thing I want you to do is focus. Like you focus your energy, like you focus your attention, I'm not asking you to focus your anger, but I am asking you when you are overcome with anger to focus. And let's see where the Bible directs our focus. Number one, tr under focus, I would write the word trust. All of my headers for you are just one word. I tried to be as simple as possible. So focus is the first point, sub point, trust. Do you see it? Trust in the Lord and do good. It's a command and it's also a cause and effect. Faith in Action is a group of folks that marched in D.C. just a couple of days ago, led by uh, Tabiti Anyabwile, pastor of Anacostia River Church there just outside of D.C. A lot of respect for that pastor. I have a lot of his books. Read it. He's not a social justice warrior. He is a Bible-believing, expository preacher who nourishes people on the word of God, but they led a march that looked quite distinct, and he said on record, you can, you can see video clips of it, but he made the statement, our gatherings must look distinct from everybody else's. Even the peaceful protests of non-believers, ours should look differently. Ours shouldn't just be marked because they're peaceable, but they should be marked because of an explicit trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and proclamation of the gospel. Trust in the Lord. You see, when we get angry and we stew in that anger, what we're saying is, I think I can handle this better than God. I'm going to come up with a plan to take care of this. I've got this figured out. Let me just ask you a question. When has that ever worked out well for you? Uh, to some of us young, we might be arrogant, ignorant, and fill in the blank and think it's, oh, no, that one time I had it all. No, you didn't. Everybody looking on thought you were? Well, just insert appropriate word there, right? I'm telling you, trust the Lord. He's capable. 
So when you are overcome, tempted to be overwhelmed with anger, focus. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend. Shepherd is a better word. Shepherd righteousness. It's a beautiful word here. Steward faithfulness. Look at all the things you have and point those things. The word here is amazing. It's like grab the staff and the rod and point all of your assets toward faithfulness. That means away from anger. Secondly, second sub-bullet under focus, you've got trust. As we're looking to God, we trust Him and we delight in Him. Now, many of us knew this verse, Psalm 37, 4. You put this in some graduation cards recently, probably. Trust or... De- yeah, trust in the Lord. Delight is the second one. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. As a young Christian, I thought, awesome. I'd like to have this, so let me just fall in love with Jesus, and He will give me this. I'm sure none of you ever struggle with that in your mature faith. None of you thought that. That's just your pastor, right? That's, that's not what this means, right? If we're trusting in the Lord and doing good and dwelling in the land, that second little subword is delight. We delight. Does delight sound like anger? No. Can I tell you, it doesn't take long to focus on the Lord and what well, the songwriter penned it well. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. We delight ourselves in the Lord. And if no sin can glory in His presence, It'd be hard for you to hang on to all your hang-ups when you're focusing on Jesus. Do you delight in God? Do you come to the Lord with a sense of wonder and awe? Oh, friend, I hope that you do. If not, pray the Lord restores that to you, the joy of your salvation. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will reorient the desires of your heart. When you are in his presence and in his word, I think you've heard a pastor say this recently. When you get in the word, the word gets into you and it rewires your heart. Trust, delight, look at the third thing. Commit, so we're focusing, we're looking to God. As we're looking to God, we're trusting him, we're delighting in him, and we're committing our way. Insert every possible word you want to insert into way. Our way, our anger, our sadness, our plans, our identity, our struggles, our guilt, our lives. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. You want to shepherd? You want to steward that anger well? You want to be angry and sin not? Trust the Lord. Delight in the Lord. Commit your way into the Lord. And now the hardest thing for us Westerners, some of you are wired well for this. Some of us are not. Look at the first two words of the next verse. Be still. Well, he will bring forth your righteousness as the noonday. Be still. Be still. This last text here. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness. Verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do you see it? Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. That's tough to do. I'm angry. I'm worked up. Everybody around me is telling me I better act. I've got to tweet. I've got to post. I've got to do something right now or my friends are going to think I don't care. Be still. Be still. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. I'm not saying be paralyzed and inactive. I'm saying when you are overcome with anger, that is not the time for you to move forward. You've got to get that anger under His control. Be still. Take a breath. Take a moment. Count to ten. If you're like some of us, maybe a thousand. I don't know. But deal with it before it deals with you. Be still. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I have spent not a few moments studying that and looking around at other texts. There's no other explicit 
promise of strength being renewed in the Bible as forthright as that one. So you say, I'm weak, I need my strength renewed. Wait on the Lord. Get in His presence. Verses 8 and 9, do you see it there? Refrain from anger. It's kind of the lesson. It's really the main point of our text this morning. And forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. This fret not yourself could also be rendered, don't get too heated up. We would say don't get all hot and bothered about everything. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, a man of wrath stirs up strife. James 1.20, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We look to God. We trust in Him. We delight in Him. We lean into Him. We commit our ways to Him, even our anger. He can handle it. We can be still before Him. Let me remind you, brother or sister in Christ, our goal is to walk in the Spirit. Our goal is to have the mind of Christ as we think through these matters. And there are many matters to think through. Our goal is to be slow to speak and to speak in such a manner that it's evident that we have been with Jesus more than we've been with Fox or MSNBC or a qualified justice movement or the zeitgeist of the age or our political echo chambers. No, it ought to be named first among the people of God that we have been with the Lord. How do you shepherd your anger? Well, you focus, number one. Secondly, you remember. You remember. Like if he takes as long on the rest of these points and he hasn't told us how many there are, we're in trouble. You're not in trouble. It's all good. Number two, remember. If you're going to take notes, I I think that focus covers verses 1 through 9. Remember covers verses 10 through 22. It's in the notes that are online. But if you're writing it down, remember covers 10 through 22. What is it we're remembering? That the justice of God is good. And there is an end to the wicked, even if we don't see it with our own eyes. The wicked here are seen as functioning on self-trust. If you go in and read this passage, I don't have time to read all the text for you here this morning. But if you read about what the wicked are engaged in in the text, boy, it sounds like something David was dealing with. But when you look around, it sounds like something we're dealing with now. There's so much anger, hate, and violence. It's unbelievable, except that it's very believable. But wicked function on self-trust. They're ravaging all they can to build their own lives by their own strength and with their own self-reliance. That's exactly contrary to the way we live our lives. We don't build anything on our own strength or on our own self-reliance. We focus. We trust we delight, we commit, we're still, and we wait on God. It may seem as though justice is being delayed as you look around. And we're an we're instant society. We want instant results. We want instant action. And if there's any delay, we interpret that as inaction. Now, there's some things you don't have to wait around about. Please don't hear me the wrong way there. But we're so used to getting everything instantly, our news instantly, and you're seeing things happen as they're happening in real time. You're watching us stream right now with maybe a 10 to 15 second delay. We get dismayed at times when we see the wicked prospering and broken systems thriving and injustice seeming to be the color of the day. And we think, where is God? Let me remind you, the rock, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 32, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Job, does God pervert justice? Or the Almighty pervert what is right? Job again, verse chapter 34, Therefore hear me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. Revelation 15, He alone is holy. All nations will come and worship him, for his righteous acts will be 
revealed. Remember, God is on his throne. He is not threatened. We don't overcome this clear and present darkness with our own finite and flawed sense of vengeance. The Bible says do not overcome evil with evil. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't envy a man of violence and choose his ways. With the perceived past that the wicked are getting, we are reminded in God's word, look at verse 20 of chapter 37 in Psalms, the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They will vanish away. Let me remind you, God has not moved off of his throne one iota, regardless. Actually, so much more, in spite of what we're seeing. He is the God of justice. We focus. You want to surrender your anger to the Lord of your anger? You've got to focus. You need to remember what the Bible says about justice and righteousness. The third thing you need to do is believe. This covers verses 23 through 29. Believe. Can I just give you a quick summary of these verses? It says, our steps are established. Believe that God will sustain his people. Our steps are established. Our failures and our falls aren't fatal. Our lives are held in his hand. We as the people of God are not forsaken. We are a blessing at all levels of socioeconomic ethno-linguistic people groups. It doesn't matter where you are in life. If you're a child of God, you can be a blessing. We are never forsaken. He says it multiple times. We are preserved forever and we have an inheritance that will never fade. There was an old Southern Gospel song years ago. It said, The world may strip me of my freedom and bind me with its chains. Health may be leave my body and be replaced with pain. They can come and take my treasure and cause my poverty, but they can't take it all away from me. They'll never roll away the rock where I stand. They can't remove the cornerstone or cast it in the sea, for I'm sheltered in the arms of God, guided by the unseen hand, and they can't take from me. Don't base your life on the abundance of things or the smoothness of how things are going. We are not promised smooth sailing. The Bible says, David writing here, I've been young. We know the verse, verse 25. And I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. Well, allow me just a side note before I hit the final two points here to say a word to you parents. Will you trust God with your children? This speaks to one of the ways we're especially vulnerable. Many of us would trust God through all sorts of pain and hardship and anger, but we worry about our children. We wonder what kind of learner stepping into. Will God take care of them? If you want to fight the temptation of being envious of the wicked or stewing in anger at this broken world, you need to believe that God is a good, good Father, and he has sovereignly ordained your child, my child's life for such a time as this. The light shines brighter in the darkness. And we, coming up on Father's Day soon, if we earthly dads wouldn't give evil gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit which gives us all we need for those who ask in Luke 11. We focus. We believe. We remember. Here's a hard one for us. We rest. Verses 30 through 34. Trust the Lord to fight your battles. Michael W. Smith has that chorus out. This is how I fight my battles. It's only about eight words long, but it's, uh, I think, a 40-minute song. But uh, this is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You can rest knowing that God will fight your battles. The Bible says, Psalm 37, 34, Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on it when the wicked are cut off. 
The same God that said he would never leave nor forsake you is the Lord who knows how to rescue the godly from trials, according to 2 Peter 2. The same God that said he would never leave you is the Lord who said to Israel in the day of battle, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed at this great word, for the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. The same God who said he'd never leave nor forsake you is the Lord who was in the fire with the three Hebrew boys. The same God who said he would never leave you nor forsake you is the Lord who stepped out on the edge of the boat one day and calmed the raging sea, speaking peace into the hearts and lives of the disciples in the midst of the storm. The same God that said he would never leave or forsake you in the midst of what you're going through is the one John saw in Revelation as the Lamb standing as though he had been slain. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, described as one of the el by one of the elders as the only one who was conquered and who was worthy to open the scroll that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could touch. This is our king. This is our valiant, triumphant, resurrected king, Jesus. He's got this. And he can handle your anger if you'll trust him. He can handle your anger if you will delight in him. He can handle your anger. Why not commit your life to him? He can conquer his foes. He can vanquish your anger before it festers and spirals into sin. Rest. Take comfort in the fact that God can handle it. Finally, your fifth note here, your last little header for the song. Reflect. It just picks up the last five verses. Reflect. Reflect on what God have done, has done and will do according to his word. Reflect on what God has done and will do according to his word. Let's go back through it real quick. First thing we do is focus. We look to God. As we focus, we trust, we delight, we commit, we get still. The second thing is we remember. We remember the justice of God at the end of the wicked. Thirdly, we believe. We believe that God will sustain his people. Next, we rest. We trust that the Lord will defend us and fight our battles. And lastly, we reflect in Him. Dealing with our anger is not found in manipulating circumstances or trying to control the conversation or people around us to shut down difficult moments that threaten our own ideology or security. We quietly, as the people of God, look to God. We surrender our anger to His Lordship and say yes to His Word and yes as His Holy Spirit sorts out our lives. As we see injustice and suffering, we must remember that as we follow Jesus, the way to glory is often down the great road of suffering. Romans 8.18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth remembering or comparing to the glory that's to be revealed. We are heartbroken by the needs and the suffering around us. We recognize that our sin, our shame, and our guilt landed on the Lord Jesus Christ as he was crucified on the cross. The wrath of God poured out on him for our sake. His substitutionary, agonizing death on a cross and resurrection from the grave three days later brings hope to the darkest valleys. And because he conquered death, hell, and the snow, he can help us steward our anger well. I know that he can keep us from spiraling. I know that I can be angry and glorify God if I refuse to stew and choose to trust him, delight in him, commit to him, and quiet my own agenda to bow before his throne. Friend, if you don't know the Lord, that's the same way you come to Jesus. Trust him. 
Allow him to rework your heart so that you delight in him. Commit to him. And die to self so that you can live for him. Would you pray with me? Father, we recognize that anger is the language of the day. And there are so many moments of injustice, and we have to remind ourselves as well that these are not just events happening around us. These are affecting people's lives and families in ways that will impact them for generations. The world is broken and will only be made right when Jesus Christ your son, the king of glory, comes back to set all things right. We know that. And you've not really called or equipped us to remake the world. You've called and equipped us to be on mission with you. To conduct our lives in such a way that when the world is crumbling around us, people see hope infused in us and visibly in us and say, these men and women, these boys and girls may not have been here or there or driven by this or that, but they have been with Jesus. And we can empathize with those around us, and we can get bothered with those around us, and we can be disgusted by sin and all of the wicked forms that it takes in front of us against our fellow men and image bearers. And we can be angry, and with our Bibles open, Lord, glorify you as we surrender to you, the Lord of our anger. Oh God, help us not to mistake this being still before you as standing silently by. But help us to be vigilant, to root out the sin in our own lives, in our own hearts, that we might bring you the glory and the honor. Grace is what we need. Strength from you. We get that as we recognize you and you alone are our cornerstone. And we go forth today in grace and peace. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Would you stand and let's just celebrate this message this morning as a confession of surrender. And last song on your sheet, Grace Alone.
of you watching and joining us online. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been our delight to worship the Lord together. We'll see you next week at the same time. Make sure you email us any prayer requests you have. It's our delight.